Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare 
Krishna, 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 Hare, 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 Ram, Hare, Ram, 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 Hare, Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare, 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 Ram, Hare, Ram, 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 Hare, Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram. Oh, 
Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya I'm going to read from Bhagavad Gita, chapter 5, text 7. Does this microphone work or is it might just... Uh, does it need it? You can hear me without it? It would be better with it. It works sometimes. Most of the time it doesn't. Bhagavad Gita, chapter 5, text 7. I'll read the Sanskrit translation and purport. Yoga Yukto Vishuddhatma Vijitatma Jitendriya Sarva Bhutatma Bhutatma Kurvana Bina Lipute <coughs> Translation One who works in devotion who is a pure soul, who controls his mind and senses, is dear to everyone and everyone is dear to him. <coughs> Though always working, such a man is never entangled. Purport. One who is on the path of liberation by Krishna consciousness is very dear to every living being and every, every living being is dear to him. This is due to his Krishna consciousness. Such a person cannot think of any living being as separate from Krishna, just as the leaves and branches of a tree are not separate from the tree. He knows very well that by pouring water on the root of the tree, the water will be distributed to all the leaves and branches, or by supplying <coughs> food to the stomach, <coughs> the energy is automatically distributed. Please forgive me, but I think I'm going to have to discard this. <coughs> um, and because because, oh, excuse me, because one who works in Krishna consciousness is servant to all, he is very dear to everyone. And because everyone is satisfied by his work, he is pure in consciousness. Because he is pure in consciousness, his mind is completely controlled. Because his mind is controlled, his senses are also controlled. Because his mind is always fixed on Krishna, there is no chance of his being deviated from Krishna, nor is there a chance that he will engage his senses in matters other than the service of the Lord. He does not like to hear anything except topics relating to Krishna. He does not like to eat anything which is not offered to Krishna, and he does not wish to go anywhere if Krishna is not involved. Therefore his senses are controlled. A man of controlled senses cannot be offensive to anyone. <coughs> One may ask, why then was Arjuna offensive in battle to others? Wasn't he in Krishna consciousness? Arjuna was only superficially offensive because, as has already been explained in the second chapter, all of the assembled persons on the battlefield would continue to live individually as the soul cannot be slain. So spiritually, no one was killed on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Only their dresses were changed by the order of Krishna, who was personally present. Therefore, Arjuna, while fighting on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, was not really fighting at all. He was simply carrying out the orders of Krishna in full Krishna consciousness. Such a person is never entangled in the reactions of work. Verse again. <coughs> One who works in devotion, who is a pure soul, 
and who controls his mind and senses is dear to everyone, and everyone is dear to him, though always working such a man is never entangled. Oma Gyana Timarandasya Gananjana Sabakaya Chakshu Andaritam Hinatas Mai Shri Gurave Namaha Pukam Kuroti Vachalam Pangam Bangaya Te Garim Yat Kripa Tamaham Bande Shri Gurundinatan Nama Om Vishnu Vidaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vidanta Swami Iti Namane Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravada Vicharine Nivishi Shashanivari Paskachade Sitarane, Jai Shri Krishna, Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Adwaiti Gadar Har Shiva Siddhi Gauru Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Srila Prabhupada begins his commentary. Uh, by saying that one who is on the path of liberation by Krishna consciousness is very dear to every living being and every living being is dear to him. This is due to his Krishna consciousness. <clears throat> it's interesting how Srila Prabhupada explains that one simply has to be on the path of liberation. And uh, the path of liberation is as described throughout the rest of the commentary is to be engaged in activities which are aimed for the satisfaction of Krishna. This morning actually in our class uh, in Srimad Bhagavatam we were speaking about liberation and uh, generally we have the concept of liberation. To become liberated means to become free from oppression. <clears throat> Sometimes oppressive rulers to, uh, or to become freed from the oppression of um, body, uncontrolled body, and uncontrolled mind, which is actually essentially what this verse is speaking about that a liberated soul, or one who's on the path of liberation, he controls his mind and senses. And uh, we were citing a verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam, wherein Srila Prabhupada speaks about the path which is called Apavarga. And he very, Apavarga means liberation. Pavarga means materialistic life. And he breaks down the word pavarga into uh, five Sanskrit syllables, which are pa, 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 ba, ba, and ma. <clears throat> and he describes what pavarga is because apavarga means the opposite. Apavarga means to become liberated from pavarga. And pavarga is the materialistic way of life defined by these five syllables which begins with the word pa, which means parishama. And the word parishama means hard labor. <clears throat> and he says first there is very hard labor and then the next word is pena which means foaming at the mouth. Generally we think of a uh, horse sometimes has worked very hard in the field and when it's worked very hard in the field the mouth begins to foam from such hard labor. So then the next word, our syllable, Ba means Bhyartata, which means disappointment. That after such hard labor, and which includes even to the point of foaming at the mouth, 
one becomes very disappointed in the uh, results of such hard labor because they didn't really satisfy her, insufficiently gave satisfaction or fulfilled all expectations. I think that's probably the best way to put it. So therefore there's disappointment. And the next word is bha, which represents bhaya or fear. And why is there fear? There's fear is there because after such hard work, to the point of foaming in the mouth, I've only became disappointed. And now what do I do next? Is it going to happen again? It's a fearful condition of life. Like, uh, after working so hard and becoming ultimately disappointed, I'm going to be very careful, cautious in my next step, pursuit in life, and try to avoid consequences I was subjected to before. <clears throat> so after all that, and then avoiding, trying to avoid suffering, as Prahlad Maharaj says, in the material world, every materialist endeavors for happiness and tries to mitigate his distress, and therefore he acts accordingly. Actually, happiness uh, cannot be achieved as long as one endeavors for happiness, because as soon as one begins his endeavors for happiness, he creates all his future distress. He creates all his conditions for future distress. So when one experiences that, one becomes fearful. And then, where does all that lead? To have to start the cycle again. Then the last word, uh, pavarga, is ma, or mitu, death. <clears throat> so apavarga, the path of liberation, means the path by which one becomes free from this cycle of materialistic life. And ultimately, becomes free from death. Although, uh, generally, we don't have to dwell on these topics uh, in order to uh, pursue or to become attracted to spiritual life. But Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita that one of the requirements for knowledge is to actually know the, to know or to be conscious of the suffering of birth and death in this world. And <clears throat> therefore, a liberated activity is that activity which is aimed or goes beyond the cycle. Sometimes people say, out, out, out of the box. How to get out of the box? How to get out of the cycle of repeated birth and death? Uh, to become liberated from all of these things it means to not have to take birth again. And therefore, uh, Prabhupada speaks in this verse, he is actually paraphrasing a verse from the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Natri Habakum Jatum Nasum, Natvam Nemi Janadipa. He's telling Arjuna that never was there a time, Arjuna, when I did not exist, and never was there a time when all these kings who were assembled on this battlefield did not exist, never was a time when you did not exist. Nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. Krishna starts off his basic ABCs of spiritual life by establishing the difference between pavarga and apavarga, or the difference between the body and the soul. And therefore, he explains that the soul is eternal, unborn, undying, primeval, ever existing. He's not slain when the body is slain. And the path of liberation means how to become free from the cycle of repeated birth and death, whereby one doesn't have to take birth again, or as Krishna in many places in Bhagavad Gita states, that one attains my eternal abode. John Makama, Jamei Divyam, Ibn Yoviti Tattvata. He says, one who understands the transcendental nature of my, my birth, my janma and my karma, my appearance and my activity in this world, 
He doesn't have to take his birth again, but he attains my eternal abode. So many places, Krishna indicates that there is a place beyond this repeated birth and death, and when one goes there, it's transcendental, it's unmanifested, it's infallible, it's the supreme destination. When one goes there, one doesn't have to come back. Dhamma parama mama. Krishna says, that's, that's my place. That's my place. That's my supreme abode. <clears throat> and uh, therefore, liberation doesn't simply mean to break free from the repetition of birth and death. But liberation means also understanding what is the eternal nature of the soul and the eternal activity of the soul. Many people have an idea when they hear about death, and they understand the nature of this pavarga. You've seen it, yeah, okay, it sounds familiar, I've been there before, been there, done that, tried, but how to break out of the cycle, because it seems like, and we were talking about this morning, that Narada Muni was speaking to King Prachina Bharasha, and he was explaining that nobody can counteract the effects of fruitive activity by manufacturing another activity which is devoid of Krishna consciousness. And he compared to be like a person who tries to awaken from a bad dream with an hallucination. Right? Just like you might have a bad dream. You know, someone's about to kill you. It's a bad dream. Nobody likes such bad dreams like that. You wake up. The room is pitch black. And you look in the distance and you see the curtains are moving. And then, and then you begin to wonder, who's behind the curtains? You know, is somebody, you wake up from a bad dream to an hallucination. It's not, it's not the solution. And he compares this like to a person who tries to become free from the reactions of fruitive activities by manufacturing another fruitive activity. Or less Prabhupada would oftentimes give the example, like the person who has a very heavy weight on his shoulder, and it's really cumbersome to the point of causing distress, severe pain. So if someone says, I'm in so much pain, uh, and they take it up, put it on the other shoulder. And then immediately there's some relief, but now it's on the other shoulder. And nobody can relieve or counteract the effects of fruitive activities by manufacturing another fruitive activity which is the void. You can't break free from that cycle by simply trying to become free from suffering. And most people have that conception that liberation means to become free from suffering. Some people even think that to become free from suffering means, uh, or liberated means to merge or to become one or to not exist. Because if I, not, if I don't exist, then I think that's pretty good. At least I don't suffer. <laughs> <laughs> and they aspire, and they think that's liberation. They aspire for that type of liberation, thinking that... But although Bhagavatam clearly states it's, it's, it's vimukta manina, it's, it's not a completely liberated state, because the soul is eternal, and, and the soul is eternal, and because the soul is eternal, the soul has desire, which is the symptom of life. So what do you do with an eternal soul who has an eternal desire and you try to become nothing, then it doesn't, it's not permanent, it's not a state of permanence. And Lord Brahma in his prayers, he says, such persons, they perform severe austerities and penances to achieve this vimukti maninas, this, this stage of liberation. They think themselves liberated, but aruya kuchrena param padam tata patanti do he says, but they fall down from that position of imagined superiority. Why? Because they fail to take shelter at Krishna's lotus feet. Because they fail to understand their eternal connection with the Supreme. They try to, to say, look, I, 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 don't want, I want to be liberated. I don't want to serve. Or sometimes they may think, and the best way to think I don't have to serve is to think I'm Supreme. <laughs> There's very convenient, very convenient uh, conclusion to all of my austerities is to merge and to become one with the Supreme. And Srila Prabhupada quotes this verse here 
In the commentary, he paraphrases this verse in the commentary, not to Ilah and Jatunasam, where Krishna says, No, sorry, never was there a time when you did not exist, Arjuna. Never was there a time when I did not exist, Arjuna. Never was a time when all these kings and the battlefield did not exist. In the future, never will any of us cease to be. So if we accept Krishna's statement as authoritative, then what is Krishna saying? Now, if Krishna was saying, Arjuna, you and I are one, then why did he make a distinction between himself and Arjuna? He would just say, hey, never was there a time when I did not exist. Never a time when, never will there be a time when I don't exist. And I'll always be. But he made a very clear statement to distinct, make a distinction that you exist, Arjuna. These kings exist, Arjuna, and I exist. We've always existed before. We're existing now. And we'll continue to exist in the future. Thus, Krishna is establishing the individuality of the soul. That the soul is eternal. And the soul's eternality uh, is that he has a personal identity and a personal desire which is distinct from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And many people, of course, they have a hard time even conceiving of the Supreme being a person. Because you know, like, they think being a person is like, like me. I'm a person, so he's a person like me, so how come? <laughs> or so, when they hear their persons eternally, then they say, wait a minute. I'm an eternal person? You mean I gotta live like this forever? Forget it. <laughs> I don't. They become fearful. Someone tries to tell them, you're an eternal person. They say, hey, no way. <laughs> I've already had enough in this, you know, and you're gonna tell me I gotta live like this forever. <laughs> I'm not gonna buy that one. You know? And but Krishna very clearly states that, no, sorry, you're eternal. So liberate, simply to become free from suffering as a state of liberation, it's a nice concept. Yes, freedom from suffering. But where does all that lead? What's next? Do I just not suffer? Is that my eternal life, not suffering? <laughs> there must be more to life than that, not suffering. What, who am I? What do I do? You know, where, where does this all lead to? And Lord Brahma even tells in his prayers to Krishna, doesn't tell, he, in his prayers to Krishna, he says that such people who try to come to this kind, kind of conclusion by their speculative process, because they don't accept Krishna's statements in Bhagavad Gita, he says he compares them to be like persons who beat the empty husk of wheat to get grain. Hmm? What do you get when you beat an empty husk of wheat? You get your hard labor. That's it. You don't get any. There's no wheat. There's no grain. You get your hard labor. So people, they speculate about their identity or the identity of the Supreme. But they don't understand that their liberated state, their liberated state can be achieved simply by establishing their relationship with Krishna. And that's why Lord Brahma says they fall down from that position because they failed to take shelter at Lotus Feet. They failed to take shelter at Krishna, who is the Supreme Person. And because he's a person who has likes and dislikes and also has desires, which are never selfish, but are always for the best interest of all living beings. Anyone who serves his desires actually serves his best interest. As Prahlad Maharaj says, that he gives the example like the person who decorates his face in the mirror. Well, you know, I'm sure many of the women have had this experience. You stand in front of the mirror and you're putting on your makeup and you're decorating the face. Do you have to decorate your reflection too? <laughs> Automatically. It's done. Taken care of. No ex extra effort is required. So in the same way, one who serves Krishna actually serves his own interest. Because, as Prabhupada says right here, one, such a person cannot think of any living being as separate from Krishna, just as the leaves and branches of a tree are not separate from the tree. He knows very well that by pouring water on the root of the tree, 
the water will be distributed to all the leaves and branches. Or by supplying food to the stomach, energy is automatically distributed throughout the body. Because one who works in Krishna consciousness, he's a servant to everyone. He's a servant to everyone doesn't mean he becomes one with everyone. But real knowledge means one who sees all living entities as spiritual sparks. In quality one with the Lord, he becomes a true knower of things. What then can be illusion or anxiety for him? His spiritual vision is he sees all living entities as individual spiritual sparks who have qualitatively one with the Supreme. They're qualitatively one. But quantitatively, there's a vast difference between the minute living entity and the Supreme Lord. That's just as there's a difference between the drop of water in the ocean and the ocean of water. And sometimes people hear this and say, yes, therefore when you put the drop of water in the ocean, it becomes one with the ocean. But no, still this, the distinct drop is there. And although uh, qualitatively the living entity has the same qualities of the Lord, and that is the living entity by nature is Ananda Mayobhyasat, he's meant to experience Ananda or pleasure, whereas Krishna is He's the Parama Purusha. He's the supreme enjoyer. He experiences the supreme pleasure. So the living the pleasure of the living being can be experienced in relationship with Krishna. So qualitatively, also the supreme, the supreme Lord is unlimitedly independent. And the living entity is also independent, but minutely. The Lord is independent, he can do whatever he wants. For Krishna, he doesn't have to do anything. Nobody's equal to him, no one's greater than him. He doesn't have to do anything. Why? Because he's supremely independent. He does what he wants to do, and, and because he's completely independent and he can do whatever he wants to do. He's part of a Purusha. If you did whatever you wanted to do all the time and didn't do anything that you had to do, you would spend your time enjoying also. Unfortunately, life doesn't work that way. We have things we have to do. And if we didn't do them, consequences would be there. But Krishna says, Namam Karmani Vlimpanti, Namam Karma Palais Priya. Krishna says, There are no consequences for me. There's no work that affects me nor do I aspire for the fruits of action. He says, anyone who knows this truth about me also won't become entangled in any reactions to work. Knowing Krishna, knowing Krishna, who is Krishna? This is transcendental knowledge. And when one knows Krishna, then yasmin vigarte same evatam vigyatam bhuvanti when Krishna becomes known, then everything else that's knowable also becomes known because Krishna is the source of everything. This is once one sees the light of the sun, he can also see himself also at the same time. Without the light of the sun, he can't even see himself. But sun, by the rising of one sun, everything that is darkness, previously in darkness, becomes revealed. Similarly, when one knows Krishna, then he knows himself. And what is the self? <laughs> That's what this verse is all about. Self is an eternal living being soul has eternal desires and the self's constitutional nature which fully satisfies the self is to be render service to the supreme and by rendering service to the supreme the supreme lord who is aham bija pratapita krishna says i'm the seed giving father of all living beings it doesn't say i'm the seed giving father of this group of people, that group of people, he's, he's not like a politician who, you know, who caters to those who vote him into office. You know, sometimes people are afraid that unless they serve a, the, the majority of their large group of people, they may lose their position. But Krishna is always Krishna. He, nobody's going to remove him. People have tried. <laughs> Pandrava tried. He got something else removed. His head. <laughs> By Krishna. Others have tried, but nobody's been successful. Nobody will be successful. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, he doesn't have to worry about losing his position. 
But his position, for those who don't know it, sometimes people think it was, why is he, why is he the supreme enjoyer? Why can't I enjoy like him? Krishna says, you can. You can enjoy like I am. I'm not keeping to this myself. I'm not attached to anything. He's not attached. He, if he was attached to having wealth, then why would he ask for a leaf, a flower, a fruit, and water? And say, I'm perfectly satisfied. Why would he ask for your bank account? Or <laughs> no, he doesn't say that. He says, if you if you offer me a leaf, a flower, and fruit and water with love and devotion, I like that. Why? Because Krishna's not attracted to the external thing. He doesn't derive his pleasure from any of these things. He derives his pleasure from love. And what is the symptom of love? What is the symptom of love? The symptom of love is to satisfy the beloved without expecting anything in return. As soon as some things, oh yeah, I'll give you as long as <laughs> I can. I share too, don't forget. But that's business. And you can't do business with Krishna. He doesn't have to sign any contract with anybody. He's independent, remember? He's independent. But he's attracted by love. He's so attracted by it that he can't refuse anybody who serves him in that mood. He can't refuse taking care of them. He can't refuse fulfilling all their necessities of life. He can't refuse delivering them. He can't refuse anything because he's bound by love. And that's all he's attracted to. And how can you, how can one serve, or how can one love without service? Actually, that's the primary characteristic of love, is to serve. To serve as Rupa Goswami describes, the characteristics of love is when the service is rendered with the aim to please the beloved, right? as the beloved desires, without expecting anything in return. So, Therefore, one who works in devotion, Krishna says, he's a pure soul. He's, the, he's working in devotion. And because he works in devotion to satisfy Krishna, then what happens? His mind and senses are automatically controlled. Because Krishna is known as Rishikesh. Savo parivinya muktam tat parat vena nyamalam. Rishikena rishikesh sevanam bhakti rojate. But this verse actually this describes that for one who engages in Krishna's service, then automatically there's two byproducts. One product, byproduct is savupada, savupadi, sarva upadi. Upadi means designation. Sarva upadi vinyamuktam means he becomes free from all designations. He no longer identifies with the body. He identifies with his real identity. I'm a servant of Krishna. He becomes free from all external, and vishikena vishikesha, his senses become controlled. Why do his senses become controlled? Because Krishna is the master of the senses. Krishna is vishikesha. He's the master of the senses, and how, because he's the master of the senses, he controls the senses of his devotees. How? Vishaya vinivartate naraparasya dehina, by giving them a higher taste. He gives them a higher pleasure. He gives them a pleasure which is so superior to the false pleasures of Pavagra. And upon experiencing that pleasure, which comes from pleasing him, devotee's senses are automatically controlled. His mind is controlled. His senses are controlled. And for a person whose mind and senses are controlled, Krishna says, how can he be offensive to anybody? He doesn't want anything from anyone. He can't be offensive to anyone because he only wants to give them Krishna. So, therefore, everyone is dear to him. He is dear to everyone and everyone is dear to him. And though he's always working for the satisfaction of the Supreme, he never becomes entangled in the reactions of his work. This is 
um, essentially what Krishna is speaking about in this verse from Bhagavad Gita. And I have a tendency to get too close to the RT time. And I can leave 90 seconds for a question. <laughs> <laughs> a comment. Challenge. You were saying when, <laughs> that uh, only through my service one can know Krishna, one can understand Krishna. Yeah. So how about charity? Can one understand him? Real charity means service. to give yeah. others the opportunity to serve. Yeah. <laughs> That's real charity. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I had a 90 second. <laughs> I have to give a 90 second, actually 15 second answer. <laughs> Do we have a five second question? Are you raising your hand? Oh, she's raising your hand. <laughs> it's a five second one? There's a question. Yes, okay. When you say the soul is eternal, you're saying that I have lived forever and will live forever? Yes. That's it. Krishna says, many, many births both you and I have had, Arjuna. I can remember all of them, but you can't. Yes. Okay. I think I have to stop. Kancha about to blow. Sankirtan, I'll answer your question after. Hare Krishna. Thank you.